Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Koval, and I'm the coordinator for the Trust Ethics and Governance Alliance in the business school here at the University of Queensland. And I'm thrilled to be hosting the Alliance's first seminar series on the psychology of conspiracy beliefs with Professor Matthew Hornsey. So I'd just like to start by first acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of UQ, I pay our respects to our ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to, Aus to the Australian and global society. And this seminar series is proudly hosted by the UQ Trust Ethics and Governance Alliance, or TIGA for short. Uh, which is a community of researchers, educators, and professionals who have a passion for building trustworthy organizations, creating ethical change, and developing a robust governance in organizations. And this seminar series really aims to share and develop a deeper understanding of research uh, in the space of trust, ethics, and governance. And we really see this as a vehicle to facilitate uh, research connections and synergies. So if this is your first TIGA event, I do encourage you to check out our website and LinkedIn page uh, for more information on our latest research insights, uh, our upcoming events, uh, including the next seminar at the end of November, uh, and our news and just general discussion. So really warm welcome to our speaker, Matthew Hornsey, uh, who is a professor of management at the University of Queensland Business School and really is an active TIGA member. Uh, he's also the co-lead for the Business Sustainability Initiative uh, Research Hub here at UQ. And a problem that Matthew has examined throughout his career is why do people resist apparently reasonable messages? Uh, his research is, focuses on the psychology of how feelings of mistrust and threat can lead people to reject messages. Uh, these insights are then translated into concrete and doable strategies for overcoming defensiveness. So thank you, Matthew, for your time today. Uh, and I really look forward to hearing more about your research in this space. So I will pass it on over to you now. Thanks. Great. <clears throat> thanks, Shannon. Um, and thanks to everyone for, for coming along. As Shannon mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about conspiracy theorists. Um, and of course, conspiracy theorists have always been with us. It has always been such. Um, but I guess, there was a tipping point about the middle of last decade where it really burst into the collective consciousness. I'm gonna go back to 2016, you would have heard this term post-truth. It was the 2016 word of the year. Um, 2016, of course, was also the year that Trump came to power um, and people were grappling with how that could have happened given his extremely unorthodox views on various scientific matters and so, um, these are tweets uh, from Trump in the years leading up to his election, peddling the long discredited myth that vaccines cause autism. Uh, here's another tweet from 2012, uh, describing what I would say is an extremely fringe conspiracy theory around the origins of climate change. Now that was 2012. So four years later, this man becomes the most powerful man on the planet. And naturally, people were anxious about what that represented. I mean, do we now live in a post-enlightenment era where you know, evidence and facts don't matter anymore and all we have left is ideology and gut feeling and superstition, et cetera? So let's fast forward from uh, 2016 to 2020 with the advent of COVID. And you think, well, surely this is a moment of reckoning. So if ever the world was going to turn to the evidence, if ever the world was going to turn to the science, this would be it. Um, and in fact, I would say that is what happened. Okay, so on the advice of scientists, all around the world, dramatic action was taken. Borders were closed, businesses were closed, etc. But almost as quickly, the conspiracy theories started. And you would have heard these conspiracy theories. So uh, COVID was invented by the Chinese government as a bioweapon. COVID was invented by America as a bioweapon. Uh, COVID was invented by governments around the world to kill off old people and reduce pension costs. Uh, COVID was a myth designed to introduce martial law and control the population. Uh, COVID is a myth designed to push vaccines on the public and to insert tracking devices in them. You might remember early last year in, in Britain, 77 mobile phone towers were damaged or destroyed on the back of conspiracy theories that it was 5G that was causing COVID. Um, in April last year, the question, is 5G safe, was the second most trending Google search term in Australia. 
Uh, and so from this perspective, you can say, well, I don't know if you could say we're li living in a post-truth world, but you could say that for a significant proportion of the population, a healthy minority of the population, perhaps, we're living in a post-trust world um, where official pronouncements from powerful elites uh, are treated with automatic suspicion. Uh, before I start ranting about conspiracy theories, I should try and define it. This is one of my colleagues' definitions, and I think it's fairly reasonable. Um, explanations for important events that involve secret plots. Obviously, if it's played out in the open, it's not a conspiracy. Secret plots by powerful and malevolent groups. So almost by definition, uh, conspiracy theories are directed towards elites or powerful groups or powerful people. Who are those powerful people? Well, it could be anyone. Sometimes scientists are included, universities are included in, in that cabal of elites that are engaging in conspiracies. Um, but most conspiracy theories revolve around a sort of unholy trinity um, involving governments, financial elites, global corporations, etc. A um, couple of things I want to point out about the definition, because sometimes people come to me and go, well, hang on, conspiracies actually happen, right? This is, this is something that actually does happen in history. It's naive to think it doesn't. And I totally agree with you. There are hundreds and thousands of documented historical examples where elites have engaged in conspiracies. This is no longer called a conspiracy theory if it's documented, it's just a conspiracy. So by definition, a conspiracy theory has not yet been proven. The, the other thing that's sort of uncomfortable in the definition, and it's not an official part of the definition, it's just a norm that's emerged, which is that people tend to reserve the term conspiracy theory, I think, for theories that lie at the more outlandish or extreme end of the spectrum. So if there's a fair bit of circumstantial evidence that a conspiracy has in fact happened, you typically don't hear people talk about conspiracy theories around that. And so that's sort of uncomfortable judgment call from an academic point of view. And, and one uncomfortable aspect of that, I think, is that the term conspiracy theory these days almost uh, exclusively has a pejorative edge. It's sort of defined almost by the logical fallacies displayed by the people who hold them. And that's one reason why I think these days, no one really wants to own that term, conspiracy theorists. Uh, I've got a family member who um, believes that COVID was basically invented by governments to control the population and to reduce population size and also to introduce the one world government. And she believes that there's eight or nine governments around the world that resisted the conspiracy, but their presidents were murdered. Now, I would say that that's a pretty elaborate conspiracy theory, but she denies she's a conspiracy theorist. It's interesting to reflect on the notion of like, is there a function of this for society? We know we spend a lot of time talking about the dysfunctional elements of conspiracy theories. And, and I'll be talking about that as well um, because conspiracy theories are part of the front line of how to whip up into group hatred. Um, it's a way of recruiting terrorists and, and um, antagonizing radical extremism. It's a way of interfering with elections and the democratic process. And as we've seen with COVID, it's something that can interfere with population health measures. So there's a lot of downsides. It is interesting to reflect on whether there's an upside. You know, I'll leave that with you, I think. But if you do a thought experiment, like what is more dangerous? Chronic suspicion about the messages from powerful elites or a chronic lack of suspicion about the messages from powerful elites. I mean, you can have too much mistrust. You can have too much trust, perhaps. Um, the other thing is you can argue that on occasions, it doesn't happen all that often, but on occasions, conspiracy theorists, history lands on their side, you know. Let's talk about now about the upsides and downsides of conspiracist thinking uh, for the individuals themselves. And, and, you know, to be honest, it's not all that much fun to be a conspiracy theorist at the moment, because uh, like I said earlier, most people don't live in a post-trust or post-truth world. Um, Conspiracy theorists are a minority. They're, they're increasingly a stigmatized minority. They're increasingly the target of ridicule. Uh, and they tend to find themselves socially isolated. And this is one of the sad human stories, I think, of the emergence of conspiracy theorizing in the public eye is that increasingly it's breaking up old friendships and, old, and, and, and it's breaking up families. And it can go both ways. I get emails from people both ways. You know, a lot of people who are like, I've lost my mother to the world of conspiracy theories and we can't have a conversation anymore. But I've also heard conspiracy, I've had conspiracy theorists email me and say, I can't hang around with my old friends anymore because I can't bear 
the fact that they're sleeping in the face of all this evil that's going on. Right. Another downside, of course, is if your whole beliefs that don't correspond to reality, then eventually you're going to make dumb decisions. I, 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 there is an evolutionary argument for why people might be prone to engage in conspiracy theories. And the argument goes like this, that from an evolutionary point of view, if you go back into our prehistoric history, there are more survival advantages associated with being chronically mistrustful then survival disadvantages. Um, and so mistrust, automatic mistrust, particularly about powerful outsiders, is just woven into our DNA from an evolutionary point of view. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. It's very difficult to, to know one way or the other. But one thing I do know is that our evolutionary history did not prepare us for a world in which there's such a thing as medicine and vaccines and international trade and doctors. And in this world, I think, you know, certainly chronic suspicion of messages from elites, you know, is a survival disadvantage. And we see this actually with COVID. We'll talk about this uh, quite a bit today, but conspiracy theorists are less likely to vaccinate and they're more likely to die. We now actually see that evidence has come through empirically. But, you know, there's, there's upsides as well. Uh, many of them feel special. It must feel amazing, like the, the universe is whispering secret knowledge in your ear. Um, you know, you are one of the few people who can see the world for the way it truly is while everyone else is sleepwalking and engaging in groupthink. It makes you feel special. And I think we know empirically that people with a high need for uniqueness tend to gravitate towards conspiracy theories. Uh, there's sort of a fun element of joining dots and solving riddles. And, and you see some conspiracy theories, for example, QAnon, where there's a big emphasis on secret messages and hidden messages, et cetera. And so everyone's there collaborating kind of on this big um, giant treasure hunt, searching for truth. And, and that must be sort of, there's an entertainment aspect to that. One major thing is the support of online community. And, and you know, like I said, there's always been conspiracy theories, always. Um, but there hasn't always been social media. and and I think that's changed the experience of being a conspiracy theorist. So if you're just a, a person sitting at home scrolling through celebrity gossip online, then you're just sort of a, a loner scrolling through celebrity gossip. But if you're posting about conspiracy theories, it changes things. So suddenly you're gonna get people coming out of the woodwork and, and giving you hearts and giving you likes and love bombing you, et cetera, and embracing you. And that must be sort of a rush. And so I think, you know, these days you could say it's a whole identity and a whole community that can revolve around it. You might wonder why I have feelings of virtue in there as an upside. And that's out of respect for the fact that that's how they see themselves. Um, so it's interesting when you talk to conspiracy theorists, there's striking similarities between, the, between their rhetoric and the rhetoric of social justice activists. Um, so when they're talking about speaking truth to power, or they're saying, you know, they're asking people to wake up, right? They're, they're actually using old Marxist language, really. I don't know if they know they're doing that, but it's old Marxist language of false consciousness, right? The, the, the fact that we are sedated. As a population, we are sedated by systems of power that prevent us from seeing the true nature of things, right? And so they're like, okay, well, we're going to, you know, fight against this, that sedation. We're going to fight against that power. And even if we're going to be stigmatized for it, we're going to do it. And that's, that's a social justice kind of activist approach. By the way, I've got the image of the matrix there on the left because that is a, it's a metaphor for false consciousness, that Marxist notion of sedation. And the iconography of the matrix is used endlessly in conspiracy blogs and websites, et cetera, the red pill, the blue pill, the white rabbit, et cetera. On the other hand, you could say, well, I mean, are they actually compassionate activists or are they selfish actors? And the, the reason I asked that second question is because there's also a lot of evidence that suggests that they tend to be prone to egocentrist threats, that they tend to be more narcissist if you do personality tests, they're more Machiavellian, which I find really interesting. Um, the argument is that they themselves are the kind of people who do whatever it takes to get something for themselves. And so they imagine that's how the world works as well. And so I was generally curious about which of these two narratives more closely fit the data. I wasn't sure how I'd do that, but then um, COVID hit and it sort of gave an opportunity. This is work that uh, I did with Cass Chapman, who's also a Tegan member here at UQ Business School. 
Um, this is data from eight nations, including Australia, where we measured belief in co various COVID conspiracy theories. And then a few months later, we measured their attitude towards various COVID-related things. And what we saw was that the more people believe in COVID conspiracies, they're more likely to do things that benefit themselves, like stockpiling, which is an inherently selfish act, and less likely to do things that um, were about protecting other people as well as themselves. They're less likely to socially distance, hand wash, mask, vaccinate, et cetera. We'd also measured their anxiety levels. Conspiracy theorists were actually relatively anxious, to be honest. But um, the more you endorse conspiracy theories around COVID, the more you're concerned for your own health and the less you're concerned for the health of close others. I'm not going to say the data were hugely strong, um, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of conspiracy theorists who firmly fit in that compassionate activist model. But just generally, the, the, it's true the data we're leaning towards this selfish actor kind of look i've been talking about conspiracy theories as though it's a global thing um i want to nuance that a little bit this isn't something i publish or anything this is just something that i help to organize my own mind when i think about conspiracy theories because there's very different types of them and knowing the different types of conspiracy theorists i think helps us know how to address it probably the people you need to worry about the least i think are the single theory single domain conspiracy theorists um, I do a lot of work on conspiracy theories, but I've got one that other people would think was strange and just that everyone I know does. Um, it's not necessarily that you buy into conspiracy theories generally, but there might just be one story out there where you go, you know what, something doesn't quite add up there and you join the dots in a certain way and you can't quite shake this suspicion. So you go through what, I'm going to use the term, a, a rational process where you reach a conclusion which you think is defendable. Um, but you're not necessarily part of a broader kind of conspiracy worldview. The other reason why you might have single conspiracy theories is when people deal with failure. So um, I call this palliative, well, I don't, I mean, other people have palliative conspiracy theories. So the idea is that it's designed to reduce the pain and the suffering associated with failure. And I, I relate to this. I, the, some of the research I've done on this is ARC funded, but the first time I put this grant in, it got rejected. And it was on conspiracy theories. And I spent days engaging in all these conspiracy theories about why I got rejected. And I was like, oh, people hate my methods. People hate me. People hate my discipline, blah, blah, blah. And then just over time, you sort of, that melts away. And then you sort of think, no, it was just, a, I just did a bad grant. I'll try again next time. More problematic is in that middle column there. This is what I call multi-theory. So you have multiple conspiracy theories, but it all tends to be in a single domain. Now, one example of that is what I call the weaponized conspiracy theories. So this is where people might have multiple conspiracy theories, but they all sort of end up leading to the same conclusion. For example, that radical Islam is trying to take over the world or that Jewish people are taking over the world and they can't be trusted. So there's one single kind of um, racist or prejudiced uh, orientation and you harness a whole bunch of conspiracy theories in a way to fight that battle. Another thing you can do is sometimes people draw on conspiracy theories to rationalize a conclusion. They're not necessarily prone to conspiracy, th conspiracy theorize in general, but they'll draw on conspiracy theories to the extent that they're convenient to reinforce the conclusion that they're desperate to reach. And, and it's probably easiest to give an example of this, right? Because I've done a lot of climate change research and you know you have this question like who are these climate skeptics climate skeptics tend to be um the more on the conservative end of the spectrum they hate the thought of big government um they, they they hate the thought of curbing freedom of enterprise and curbing freedom of individual expression so pro big business anti-big government climate science is a nightmare because it does imply a big government response right that's a sign that will like in some ways curb certain freedoms and so they do whatever it takes intellectually to decide that nothing needs to be done. And so they'll engage in a whole bunch of conspiracy theories about where that science comes from. Right? And that's where you get people just cascading around a whole lot of miscellaneous conspiracy theories. Um, the Chinese one, which you don't hear that often. The idea that it's just governments have made it up because it's an excuse to control your life. Uh, a bit like COVID, right? Or scientists have made it up because they get money for it or scientists have made it up because um, it advances their green Marxist agendas, bloody blah, blah. One thing, and I'll show you the data later, but one thing about 
climate skeptics has endorsed these types of conspiracy theories, but actually they're not terribly prone to endorse other types of conspiracy theories that don't relate to climate. So really it's just in my mind, a post hoc rationalization of a conclusion that they're desperate to reach, right? It could be the true of creationists as well. So depending on your religious upbringing, you may be committed to a creationist view that humans were invent, you know, basically created 10,000 years ago by God and there was no evolution. But to defend that argument, eventually you have to resort to conspiracy theories to kind of rationalize it. Uh, but it's not to say that you're a conspiracy theorist at heart. You know what I'm saying? Okay, on the right-hand side, there's the multi-theory, multi-domain conspiracy theories. Um, one sad aspect of, some people have just got flagrant mental illnesses and if you've got paranoid delusions, you tend to be prone to conspiracy theories. Uh, but I'm gonna focus on the bottom one there, subscription to a conspiracist worldview. Um, because for some people, this is how they see the world. It's just an orientation that they think is commonplace uh, for networks of elites to execute these sinister plots and to do it in near perfect secrecy. This is what happens all the time. To believe anything else is naive. Right? Now, if you have that worldview, which a surprising number of people do, if you have that worldview, then you're going to be open minded to just about all conspiracy theories. Right? Not necessarily 100% believing them, but open minded to them. Right? Even ones that seem logically incompatible. So when Osama bin Laden, uh, was assassinated back in the day. There were two conspiracy theories around that. And one of them was that um, America was lying about the assassination, that in fact, Osama bin Laden had already passed away in 2001 from Marfan's disease. Uh, another conspiracy theory was that he, America was lying. He's still out there, he's still alive. Now, technically, you can only believe one of these two conspiracy theories because somebody can't be both alive and dead. Um, but if you measure it, you see this positive correlation. The more you believe he was already dead, the more you believe he's still alive, which, which sounds ridiculous from a logical point of view, but it makes perfect sense from a, a worldview point of view. It's like your antenna is just alive to any alternative account of reality, right? Now, anti-vaxxers, you know, I've made the case that climate skeptics are in that middle column. Anti-vaxxers, I think very much are in that right-hand column. Uh, I'll show you how I, I, I think I know that. This is uh, data I collected uh, around the world. I asked people the extent to which they endorse four world famous conspiracy theories. To what extent do you believe that Princess Diana was murdered? Uh, to what extent do you believe that there's going to be a new world order, the government's conspiring to take over in a world one world government? Um, to what extent do you think that JFK was not killed by a lone gunman, but as part of an organized conspiracy? Um, and to what extent do you believe that America knew 9 11 was going to happen and they sort of let it happen because it was convenient to them? Um, so they could pick wars on Islamic countries, right? So, um, you know, we collected a lot of data, thousands of people, just to give you some sense of it. The JFK conspiracy is the most famous conspiracy in the world. Um, so people on average were way above the midpoint on that one. The, the, the Princess Diana one, people were pretty much on the midpoint. So as many people agreed about that as disagreed. And the other two were slightly below the midpoint, like 2.75 on a five point scale, right? Anyway, so one thing to keep in mind, whoa, one thing to keep in mind is that people who believe in one of these conspiracies tended to believe them all. Or if you don't believe in one, you tend to not believe in them all. There's huge correlations among them. So you could just aggregate them together and create a score of the extent to which you have a conspiracist worldview. So that's what I did. And in this study, I was interested in that shoes towards various scientific issues, because it turns out people with a conspiracy worldview um, fond of cultured meat, for example, or nanotech, they've got an issue with that. But those relationships are pretty small. What wasn't small was the relationship between conspiracy theorizing and anti-vax attitudes. These are correlations from, what is it, 25 nations? This is Australia down here, right, second bottom. This blew me away. Um, it, it, it's, it's a significant relationship in every single one of those countries. But I was just blown away by the size of the relationship because remember these conspiracy theories had nothing to do with vaccinations <laughs> or anything to do with science, right? But you could predict with the degree of accuracy whether people were anti-vax on the basis of whether they thought Princess Diana was murdered. This huge overlap, particularly in the West, you'll notice that this huge overlap between the conspiracy world and the anti-vax world. 
And when you talk to people, it's very clear why that is. So the mechanism through which that works is big pharma, right? So you believe that powerful elites conduct these elaborate hoaxes on the public um, and they get away with it. And, well, and then you think, well, who profits from vaccinations? It's big, and they've got their tentacles everywhere and they control everything. And that's all you need to know. Sorry about this crazed um, figure. These are also, this is exactly the same data looking at the relationship between conspiracy theorizing and climate skepticism. And this is the correlation down here. Can you see my cursor? It's like nothing. It's just not significant. And I mean, it's significant in America. It was significant in Singapore for reasons I don't understand, but in every other country it was not significant. So that's why I think that the, the conspiracy theories around climate change occupy a different psychological phenomenon than the conspiracy theories around vaccination. Who are these conspiracy theories? We know that they are prone to seeing patterns and agency and things that are actually random. They're intuitive thinkers. I'm trying to have non-judgmental language around this. They're not good at rational cognitive reflection necessarily. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and bottom line this. If you give people scales that look a bit like this, okay? To what extent do you agree that it's important that I personally, it's important to me that I can justify my beliefs using, beliefs using rational arguments and evidence. There's no relationship between that and being a conspiracy theorist, right? Conspiracy theorists are just as likely to say that they endorse that kind of notion than non-conspiracy theorists. But if you give people little puzzles that require kind of log logical cognitive reflection, they're just not as good at it, All right? So this is one of those things, I don't know if you've already answered this question in your mind, a bat and a ball cost a dollar ten in total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? And then your brain goes, "It's ten cents, right?" And then, and then hopefully your brain goes, "Oh, hang on, no, that doesn't work out." And you do the math, and you go, "Oh no!" And then you work it out, and the answer is five cents. Right? So what I'm seeing is that they sort of like to think of themselves as highly rational and evidence based, but they're just not that good at it. So they think differently from other people, but they also feel differently. And, and on the whole, they don't feel that great, I would say. They, they, they report feeling relatively powerless. They tend to be disproportionately um, exist in marginalized parts of society. They report a lack of control and agency of things. They're highly mistrustful, of course. So there's not much fun. These are the kind of people that flock towards populist parties. Um, and actually, sometimes people think, oh, is it left-wing people who are more conspiracists or is it right-wing people who are more conspiracists? It's both. The further you are to the extreme end of the spectrum, then the more likely you are to be a conspiracy theorist. And this Trump is, it's, it's really important for me to talk about Trump because he was such a game changer and such an outlier, I think, among world leaders for a whole range of reasons. One of them is that, um, he was the only president that I know of who was sort of on the record with, with facts hesitant views. Um, but the other reason is that he's the most um, conspiracist world leader I've ever seen. Uh, he's, he endorses many fringe conspiracy theorists, theories. And I think a lot of conspiracy theorists see an ally in, in Trump. You've already processed, this is my data. Um, Trump voters are more anti-vax. MMR concern is the measles bonds from Bella vaccine. Um, Trump voters are more anti-vax, but it's interesting to look at why. And I don't know if you can process that figure, but basically what that's saying is, yes, Trump voters are way more conservative by definition, but there's a very weak relationship between that and anti-vax views. Okay, the other thing to know about Trump voters is they're way more prone to believe in conspiracies. The Princess Diana was murdered, 9-11 was inside job, bloody blah. And there's a big relationship between that and anti-vax views. What do we do about it? Sometimes people are like, what do I say to these conspiracy theorists? And um, I mean, one thing that I think we've all fallen in the trap of doing this, um, it's just to try and defeat their arguments with logic and evidence. And 99% of the time that's not gonna work. And I really encourage people to save the frustration, you know, because basically you're just gonna talk into your blue in the face, but there's no point talking to somebody who's not willing to change their mind. And, and if somebody is like a, a a kind of rusted on conspiracy theorists, they're not motivated to change their mind and so there's no point. Also, you can't ever disprove a conspiracy theory, you just can't. Because all sources of evidence can be challenged and all reality can be challenged. Um, 
and so you can just replace discredited theories with new one or whatever. So basically, I think you know, if there's one thing you can take away from this, don't try and like just mash evidence in people's faces. It's just making you both frustrated. Um, the other thing is the got to be careful with denials and fact checking kind of sides. The evidence is a bit mixed on this, but there is some evidence that what, what you're doing is you're raising the familiarity and the profile of that conspiracy theory. So if you have fact checking kind of stuff, don't say, here's the conspiracy and here's the evidence that's disconfirming it. Because potentially you're giving oxygen to the conspiracy. You know, I think a lot of people, the only reason they knew about the 5G conspiracy was because they kept on reading about those articles on the ABC discrediting it. So if I said, well, you know, okay, this is hypothetical, of course, but if I said, you know, there's a conspiracy theory out there that the only reason I got funding to do this research is the government uh, using me as a Manchurian candidate to discredit people who are blowing the whistle on plans that the government has to basically introduce fascist rule. And that's absolutely ridiculous. And here are the reasons why that's ridiculous, right? See what I've done? Like I've planted in your mind something that has never occurred to you. And, and we know this from the rumor disconfirmation literature and a whole bunch of things. It's best not to go there. Don't give it oxygen. Look, I've, I've got a paper um, a few years ago with Kelly Fielding talking about jujitsu persuasion. And this is all about why you can't just win arguments with evidence and logic alone. That sometimes if things are coming from an underlying worldview, you have to listen to that. Think about the worldviews of the people that you're trying to influence, and then you tailor your message to align with that worldview. Um, and so what is that? I mean, I've done this with conspiracy theories and a whole bunch of things, sorry, with climate skepticism. What would it mean for conspiracy theories? Well, this is what it might look like, but I've actually, you know, I, I can't, I haven't actually tested this myself yet, but rather than trying to fight the mistrust, you'd have to concede to the mistrust, right? So for example, rather than saying, well, Big Pharma can be trusted, you don't need to say that, right? You don't need to say that, you're never gonna win that battle. I mean, one thing is that, it, to me, it's a frustrating double standard that people assume that there's profit motives that warp the morality of one multi-billion dollar industry, but they look at the wellness industry, another multi-billion dollar industry, and they presume that their messages are completely authentic. And so it would be about trying to concede to the mistrust, but also pointing out profit motives in the alternative argument. Or I guess you just say, look, no one, I mean, no one's really in the business of trusting big pharma. Governments don't trust their messages. Science doesn't trust their messages. That's why we have these thick layers of regulation so that there's independent verification of claims they make that are taken out of their hands and they're in the hands of people without those best interests. Another apology for this figure, but just, just take a look at the, the headline, I guess, the, the heading of that slide. That I have two reasons for saying this. Um, and one is to be nice. We only have so many family members. We only have so many old friends by definition. So, you know, do whatever it takes to hang in there. And if that means just steering the conversation clear of conspiracy theories, then maybe do that. Um, but the other reason I think that's a good thing to do is that we know that people are heavily influenced by the behaviors of their loved ones, right? And with COVID, that's extremely powerful. And my data, the far and away the most powerful thing that predicts whether people use masks or they vaccinate or whatever it is, is whether the people that they know and love, whether they do those things, all right? So it's really just normative stuff. And that's what we're seeing here. If you can see my cursor, this is a negative relationship between conspiracy mentality and vaccination intentions. Conspiracy theorists are less likely to vaccinate. The exception up here is when people feel as though people that they know are vaccinating. And then I don't think they love it, but they're probably just going to do it anyway, right? So there's also a strategic reason to stay in the lives of conspiracy theorists and to steer them towards kind of healthier behaviors. Uh, before I wind up, I mean, a couple of these points I've already made. Uh, another point is that one thing that we need to remember is that a lot of the conspiracy theories haven't just bubbled up out of nowhere. They've been planted in the minds of society by provocateurs, agents of hate who have personal interests. All right, so they actually are exploiting conspiracy theories because it's a wonderful way to manipulate the public and to suit your personal agenda. And so I think we need to be calling out those people and potentially silencing them 
I know social media companies are working on ways to, to, to censor and to, to block certain views from certain people. I suspect that this is a, going to be an interesting discussion point at the end of this talk about the upside and downside of censorship and mandating, et cetera. Uh, the other thing is, I guess you've got to, you know, play the long game. I mean, if, if it's true that feelings of powerlessness and marginalization provide the terrain from which conspiracy theorists grow, um, then it's good to respond to that, make sure that, you know, do whatever we can to make sure that there's as few people as possible who feel powerless and marginalized in society. And the other thing is, it's, it, it's good to remember that even though some conspiracy theories seem ridiculous, that sometimes, you know, there are legitimate anxieties that underpin them. So we do need to hold governments to account if they're lying or playing games or in fact engaging in conspiracies. And we need to keep, you know, be vigilant about signs that profit motives are kind of warping the decisions or the, 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 the messages from financial sector or big pharma or whatever it is. We need to make sure that our tech and AI systems uh, are not encroaching on people's freedoms and dignities. Um, and so that's, that's, that's another long game kind of attitude is that we just try and do whatever we can to make sure that these institutions are as trustworthy as possible. It's not going to eliminate the conspiracy theories, but of course it might help. Uh, so on that note, I'm just going to hand it over to you um, for a chat. I've got a bit of time. That was fabulous, Matthew. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I see that online we have um, a couple of questions and um, I also have a question myself, I guess, to kickstart um, the discussion with the Q&A. I really found the, uh, the taxonomy of your conspiracy theories really, really interesting and the three categories that you had displayed. Um, and it can really resonate with that single um, conspiracy category uh, with uh, particular events in the past. And I just wondered, have you looked at uh, the progression between those categories? So for instance, with the first one, you know, you adapt a, a particular conspiracy theory on, on one particular topic. Can you eventually end up in that third category uh, as a conspiracy theory? Is it a natural progression? Um, I can't point to data on this, but I think it is. So I think what happens these days is that you might trend towards conspiracy theories. Um, okay, one, one, in my own data, in addition to being conspiracy theorists, uh, some anti-vaxxers are just terrified of needles and hospitals and the techno-Western medical system, right? It's a phobia, virtually, right? And so rather than concede to that phobia, you might start to develop conspiracy theories or a worldview that helps you avoid those triggers for your anxiety. And then in the process of embracing those conspiracy theories, you get introduced to various online communities that introduce you to other conspiracy theories. And then now it's gone from being just a post hoc rationalization, which is something in the middle category of that taxonomy. And it's drifting towards something that's actually more of a worldview and identity uh, and it's drifting towards the right-hand side. So absolutely, I believe, you know, just exactly what you said, Shannon, I think that that can happen. I have a question from Adam. I don't know, Adam, if you wanted to ask a question to Matthew. Sure, I can do. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thanks, Matt, uh, for that presentation. That was really interesting. And uh, I really like this line of research. And then when you were talking about, you know, who is most likely to engage in conspiracy theorizing and how they tend to be more anxious and you know, by definition, uh, have these unusual ideas. It kind of just made me think to the big five personality factors, wondering if you've looked at those in your research yet, in particular thinking, you know, I would imagine they might show this really interesting pattern of high neuroticism and high openness to experience, being openness to unusual, weird ideas. Uh, and that combination of the two, I wonder if you've looked at that? No, I, I haven't. I'm not a personality researcher. Um, I, I, I couldn't rule it out, um, but I think it sounds like an interesting empirical question. When I've seen the personality stuff, it's tended to be more down that dark triad kind of stuff. So we see with the Machiavellianism and the narcissism, et cetera, we tend to see that. It's interesting with the notion of them being relatively anxious. I think what, what I see in the data, and again, this is not my research, this is other people's research, they talk about egocentric threats. So, so it's, not, it's not like they're anxious about things in general. They're highly sensitive to things that encroach on, on them. And that's where they're particularly anxious. Um, so I don't know where that would fit in with the neuroticism thing, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting 
it's an interesting argument um, whether people who are open to experience would be more likely to gravitate towards conspiracy theories. I haven't seen that effect out there, but that's not to say it's not there. I have a question for you about the interventions from, say, the government or even corporate side. In your research, are you getting any sense of what the most effective interventions are for um, reducing conspiracy beliefs or at least the harmful um, consequences of that for, say, individuals or society more generally? Um, I can't point to that. There's a huge amount of mystification about how to reduce conspiracy theories just generally. Like there's no single thing. You know, I've speculated about a few things that might work, but um, this is one of the huge problems in the field. You can't find a way of necessarily reducing the conspiracy theorizing. But what people can do is to interrupt the relationship between the conspiracy theory and harmful or damaging behaviors, right? So we might not be able to do much about the anti vax conspiracy theories, but can we get people to vaccinate anyway? And, uh, you know, that was part of that last study that I showed where I'm saying, well, you know, when there's a norm around you that everyone around you is vaccinating, then it interrupts the link between conspiracy theorizing and, and refusing vaccination. Now, the obvious uh, thing out there at the moment uh, is do you mandate it? Okay, so, uh, or do you basically impinge on the freedoms of people who don't vaccinate? So you basically use coercive kind of regulations to try and get people to do the right thing. And it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting question. And it's sort of split the social sciences a little bit. I'd say that, uh, you know, historically, maybe in, in I could be wrong, but I, I think in, in law and, and, and policy studies, and maybe even economics, there has been an open-mindedness to using government regulation to basically um, coerce positive behaviors out of people. In the psychology community, there's, uh, and in the, population health community, there's a real reluctance to go down the mandated path with vaccines. And the argument is that it's going to radicalize people. And I, 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 to be honest, like, of course, it will radicalize people. And it does. I mean, you see this very strongly. And you've seen, I don't know if you, how close you are um, to the rhetoric of anti-vaxxers and, and um, freedom protesters and anti-COVID type of demonstrators, but they very much have embraced this language of being victims and like victims of discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you kind of, there's this radicalization, polarization, a sense of reactance to having their freedoms impinged upon, and then moral outrage that flows on from that. The other thing you're doing, of course, is that in their mind, you're proving the conspiracy. Right? So the conspiracy is that this is an excuse for governments to do X, Y, and Z. And then there's people ringing the bell saying, you can't do this to us. And what happens? Laws come in and, you know, to try and impinge on their freedoms. And social media companies censor them. And police come in and throw them out of their protests and stuff like that. And so you can see all this, the potential for it to backfire. And I honestly can't make up my mind on this. Um, you know, I was just talking to Martin Edwards about this before, because, you know, BHP, are, I don't know if Martin's in the audience here, but BHP are weighing this up right now, and many companies are. Do they mandate the vaccines? And if they do, like, what impact is that going to have on their employees? Um, you know, four days of the week, I think, do it. Just do it. And if they radicalise, what does it matter if they're going to go and vaccinate anyway, right? And then three days of the week, I think the opposite. So I don't know if other people have views on this, because I, I can't make up my mind. The very last study I saw on this suggested that actually mandating vaccinations increase vaccination intentions um, rather than necessarily backfiring. But yeah, I think the, the jury's out on it. I see Paula has her hand up. Paula, did you have a question? <laughs> I do, I do. That was really an excellent presentation. Uh, it just spoke to so many things that I think all of us are concerned about right now, about you know people we know and love who've turned into um, anti-vax conspiracists and stuff. Um, it was really helpful, your thoughts on how to respond to that. I'm curious about, because you also drew links to like how this can be used for radicalization and uh, for those who want to foment hate. Is there any success, and it's slightly adjacent, um, you know, there's these de-radicalization programs to try and deal with those who have, you know, been, had these 
disbeliefs and conspiracies, um, particularly from a perspective of Islamic terrorists. Do you know if there's any sort of success in doing those things? Is there success in deconspiracizing people or de-radicalizing people once they've gone down this path? And, and, and what kinds of things would that involve? I might just throw that open to, to the audience because I, I think with the de-radicalization, I, I'm aware that there's sometimes programs to try and get people to de-radicalize. Um, and I, I can't speak, I mean, after some of them claim success, like part of it is really dislocating them from the social networks that they've, they've basically been captured by <laughs> and separating them so that they're no longer privy to those kind of intense social networks that, that impinge their ability to see things clearly. But the problem with any of these programs is the self-selection program. Like, you know, you, you need to want to change, <laughs> want to be different to be able to self-select into some kind of program. But I'll be talking slightly out of my wheelhouse if I speculate too much about the de-radicalization. I don't know. I think that, uh, you know, Martin Rhesius, I don't want to dob you in, Martin. He's probably the person who'd be better able to talk to that. Uh, the other thing that's going on, of course, is the, the, the notion of basically starving on oxygen, oxygen. And this is where there's that very delicate thing from the social media companies. Do you censor? Do you bar? Do you flag um, dangerous views, et cetera? At what point? Do you, do you maintain that boundary between freedom of speech and responsible speech? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks so much, Matt. It was super interesting. Just, just so I want to know if there are any practical tips in terms of running this sort of surveys on, on sensitive topics. I was wondering, for example, these people, were they aware that they are participating in a study about conspiracy theory? And, you know, were, were, they, were they feeling safe or honest to, to to respond. So we had this, this notion that, that pollsters got the elections wrong in, in the US because people were sort of ashamed to, to admit they are they are voting for Trump. Is that is that is that an issue or, or were there, are there any tips in terms of basically making sure that the responses are, are genuine? Yeah, I mean the, the the most important thing is that you don't flag that they, you're going to be asking about conspiracy theories. Um, so basically you know you spend all this time designing a survey. And then you've got to be the most important part really is the title of the, the survey when people are clicking on it online. Because you just have to have something ultra neutral. Um, like, I mean, just about every survey I ever send out is titled something like your views about people in society or something like that. Something really, really neutral. Because otherwise you will get this huge self-selection problem coming into the survey and then your data is useless. Um, yeah. Thanks. The other, the other very, very tricky thing, because I'm trying to do cross-national research now, I'm looking at, um, you know, the public face of, of conspiracy theories tend to be these kind of white men, I guess, on the whole, like, but uh, actually when you measure it, um, it you, you get a lot more conspiracy, about conspiracy theorizing in non-Western nations, right? And even within Western nations, it tends to be, you get more conspiracy theories like in minority kind of uh, communities. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to work out, you know, how do we tap into conspiracy theorizing among people who have experienced medical racism or people for whom they've grown up in a country where the biggest source of misinformation and propaganda is their government, right? And so that's been very tricky for me to, to get people to be honest about how they feel about governments that may not be, you know, if, particularly if they're in a non-democratic or non-transparent country. It's very, very delicate. Um, but I, I want to do more of that research. And, and part of doing that research means weaning yourself off this pejorative tone that I've been part of up to this point. Conspiracy theories, theorists are, uh, you know, they're, they're narcissists, they're, they're not very rational, they're selfish, blah, blah, blah. But when you look at it from an international point of view, there's a whole lot of other reasons why people might endorse conspiracy theories. And so you have to have a more compassionate and politically neutral perspective on that. Matthew, if I uh, might chime in, because, because <laughs> you brought it up in, in the conversation, um, from my point of view, or from, from what, what we see in our research is that there are just no real successful counter extremism programs. Um, and to our understanding, that st stems just, um, and first of all, there are no measures really. And uh, because how do you measure something that has not happened? That's been just a big, or that doesn't concur. So how do you, how do you measure that people stop, don't believe in conspiracy theories? How do you measure that people 
don't engage in extremism. It's just difficult. So that, that's an empirical problem. But the more fundamental issue that I, I see in the field and, and, and um, the, or that we identify is that a misconception about these online phenomena is that basically relating the, considering them as, the, as, as an extension of the traditional things that have been going on. As you mentioned, conspiracy theories have been around um, for a long time. And now we just claim that, well, now we have conspiracy theories and they're happening online instead of, and we argue that actually these new phenomena, similar to echo chambers, filter bubbles, fake news, need to actually be considered as a digital transformation of these traditional phenomena with new, completely unique societal implications. So in the context of extremism where we work in, we see, for example, that females actually become empowered in extremist movements and get a much more significant role. We see that online technologies have a much more, or like a stronger exacerbating impact on group polarization than traditional phenomena, which also has introduces also obviously unique challenges, but also unique solutions. So one of the things we're trying to work on is through social bots and whatnot. But so the, the talking point, the point that I'm trying to emphasize is that we need to see these phenomena from my perspective more as a digital transformation with respect of societal implications instead of just a transfer of the old problems into an online context, sort of just like the difference between digitization, digitalization and actual digital transformation. Um, and apply that knowledge towards these phenomena. And then we can actually help, once we understand these phenomena in the, in the context of a digital transformation, we can actually develop the, or address them properly. Sorry for rambling on. No, don't <laughs> just apologize wanted... at all, that was brilliant. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, I, I'm, I'm aware of, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat aware of the work you're doing and also with mm -hmm. colleagues of mine in psychology and then I'd love to hear more about it because it just sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Matt, I, my video is not working at the moment. I, I know uh, time's probably running short. I was just wondering about, I, I like your, um, your idea about responding to uh, people who believe in these things. I'm just wondering about what, what your thoughts are on, on a micro level. So I'm thinking about individuals, right? So conspiracy theories about, you know, large organization. How about individuals and micro level? You know, do you see there, there's a, a link here or how to respond as well <laughs> for, for somebody who you know as paula suggests jokingly that somebody's out to get them at, at a micro level or somebody's that like that, like another individual is out to get me that, like, that's well, right. yeah. or, or within the organization a micro organization for example yeah that's something i really want to look at i i, I can't i can't speak to this issue but my never and i certainly have an agenda of doing stuff on workplace conspiracies and organizational <laughs> conspiracies like within organizations because sure, i think that yeah. would be really fascinating we're working on the measurement challenges associated with that okay. um, but basically my advice to everyone like in any of these contexts is you know rather than just jumping straight in let's say you feel as though someone's engaging in a conspiracy theory that you don't buy rather than just jumping in and trying to discredit it you just do a lot of really high high quality listening because usually underneath that message, underneath the words, there's, there's a deeper thrum. There's like a, a deeper issue, whether it's a fear and anxiety and insecurity. Um, and so basically your goal is to listen to that and find out what that is. And sometimes the less you say, um, the more likely you are to stumble upon what that underlying issue is. And then you've got something to work with. Matthew, can I ask you a quick question? That was absolutely fantastic, Trevor, and here. And um, what's the, the the life cycle of a conspiracy theory? So, how is it birthed, and what's the staging before it actually becomes something that's not just paranoia in someone, but rather becomes, you know, tainted so that the multitude take it on as a, um, you know, something that's a political movement in and of itself. Yeah, it's a fascinating question. It's not something I can answer, but I one thing I think that um, I, I'm very conscious of, and this has always historically been true, is that you know in, it's it's actually a language that you don't have, hear so much in the stuff on on um, violent intergroup behavior in the West, but you hear it a lot in places like Indonesia, etc. They talk about provocateurs. They use that language that there's people whose job it is to create hate, and right now. The simplest, fastest way to do that is to plan and then propagate um, conspiracy theories. 
But uh, if you, I mean, it's actually very difficult sometimes to know where these things come from. I don't know if you've seen the QAnon documentary, I think it's on Netflix, but it's all about trying to work out where the hell these came from in the first place. Uh, it's a fascinating question. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, Matthew, for that um, very fascinating and informative uh, presentation. And for everyone online for joining us today, uh, please do keep an eye out for our next seminar uh, next month. Uh, Tapani will be presenting on the Australian case study on the government's robo-debt program. So really fascinating stuff, um, which I look forward to as well.